Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Levin, for the very kind introduction. So, and thanks to everybody for coming, well, <clears throat> to my uh, part two of my tutorial. So, right, the routine is I'm going to turn off my video to conserve bandwidth, and uh, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, so, uh, yes. So, the thing is, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, show my slides, but, well, you know, the you have seen something like this right in the previous part. So, and the thing is, uh, for those of you who's uh, joining for the first time, I would like to, uh, well, you know, you, it's, you, you don't really miss much. I'm just going to recap, uh, you know, the first definition that I had been, I discussed last time. But essentially, uh, this could be uh, regarded as a standalone tutorial that is independent of the first one. Okay. Now, the thing is, uh, the both tutorials, right? You know, the both parts of the tutorials uh, is uh, intended to be uh, a very int elementary introduction to tenses. Okay. Well, so if you want a highbrow approach, right, many people at this uh, conference who could give uh, that kind of uh, 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 tutorials, right? There's several, right, in this uh, series. Uh, mine is, well, as the title suggests, is going to be the most elementary of all. Okay. Right. The thing is, uh, you know, the point is to actually go over the three definitions of a tensor, okay? The three standard, most commonly used uh, definitions. And uh, to convince you that they all remain useful today, right? And in particular, they still play a role in computations, okay? Well, we went over the first one last time in part one, and arguably that is the trickiest one. That is the most difficult one to discuss because it was a definition that was somewhat and dated. Okay, it's uh, invented more than 120 years ago. And it was, uh, you know, before, you know, it was done during the days when we don't have easy access to notions like, you know, vector spaces or bases or matrix or even matrix multiplication. Okay, so that was the trickiest one to discuss. And fortunately, we are over that. Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about the second and the third. Okay, and the thing is, uh, well, that was the plan. Okay, when I typed this first slide, unfortunately, you know, uh, by the time I got to the end of the second part, you know, the multilinear map, uh, you know, I sort of uh, ran out of time. Okay, I don't think I would have time to talk about the the tensor product of vector spaces today. Okay, uh, you know, if I get an opportunity, I would talk about that, but probably not today. So today we're going to focus on the second definition of tensor that is arguably the easiest one, okay? If you know what is a linear map, you automatically know what is a multilinear map. And that's what we're going to talk about today, okay? Now, so the thing is, uh, recap from the last uh, lecture, from the last tutorial, right? Well, the uh, take home idea, right? The main idea that uh, I was trying to, uh, well, you know, argue is that the definition, definition one, the, essentially says that a tensor is defined by its transformation rule, okay? Right, so the thing is, uh, and we, let me go over an example that we saw in the last tutorial, right? Is, well, this three by three matrix, a tensor. Well, the question makes no sense, okay? The thing is, uh, you cannot say whether a matrix is tensor, a uh, tensor, right? At least, you know, if you want to discuss this in uh, via definition one, you know, the point is that you need a context, okay? this matrix could represent a tensor and it could, it might represent something else that's not a tensor, okay? And the thing is, uh, you know, the last time, this is some, just uh, well, going over what we talked about last time. Let's say the three by three uh, matrix represents stress, okay? Uh, well, so the thing is that's a physical object. And the thing is this comes from this numbers that you see in the matrix that comes from various measurements, okay? And in which case it would be a tensor. It's a contravariant two tensor. If you change coordinates, right, if you change the x and y axis, if you rotate them, it's going to transform like x a x trans x transpose a x. Okay, so that's a contravariant two tensor as we saw. So this is defined by the transformation law. Okay. Now the thing is that if you are interested in is the eigenvalues or eigenvectors, then the same matrix, right? Even if it has exactly the same value, it's not going to be a mixed two tensor. Okay. So it's now a completely different tensor. Okay. Now the thing is, uh, if I don't provide a context like this, then the question as to whether this matrix makes is a tensor, it makes no sense. Okay. This is 
This is essentially the take home idea from last time. Okay. Uh, but if you're interested in something like the Hadamard product of this matrix, then, you know, it's not a test. Okay. Because the, the notion of Hadamard product is not preserved under any of the two tensor transmission laws. Okay. So if you're interested in a Hadamard product, then it has nothing to do with tensors. Okay. Then in which case, that matrix is not a tensor. Okay. Now, the thing is the indices, the fact that it has two index, the matrix is indexed by. I and J that tells you nothing, okay? The multi-index object, you can disregard that part, okay? Now, the thing is, for instance, right, if I have a matrix, any matrix, N by N matrix. Now, if I'm gonna do a transformation by multiplying on the left by a invertible matrix or by its inverse transpose, okay? Then the thing is, in this case, this matrix, this N by N matrix is either a covariant matrix, if I multiply by X, or you multiply by X inverse transpose, then it's a contravariant one tensor, okay? Now, even though it has two indices, it, it's a one tensor because of the transmission rule. The tra transmission rule determines what tensor it is, okay? It has nothing to do with indices, okay? For instance, if I'm going, doing QR algorithm, I'm doing household QR, I'm applying that to my matrix, then I'm actually regarding it as a covariant one tensor, okay? If I'm talking about equivariant neural networks, well, if you look at the, the equivariant neural networks literature, you know, they have uh, all kinds of arrays, right? You know, uh, you know, like uh, you, might, you might have matrix or you might have a three-dimensional matrix or five-dimensional matrix. But in all this example, in, in, in equivariant neural networks, all you're talking about is that it's a covariant one tensor, okay? An equivariant neural network is about covariant one tensors, no matter how many indices you have on your inputs, okay? So the point is that the multi-index object is not a tensor. The transmission rule tells you what is the tensor, okay? Now, the thing is, is of course, is a little bit confusing, which is why I said definition one is the hardest and the trickiest one to explain, okay? So ideally, we want to fix that. We want a coordinate-free definition that doesn't depend on coordinates and therefore doesn't depend on indices, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to provide, remember that definition one was a tricky definition in part because it left, you know, the uh, tensor unspecified, okay? It says that, you know, a tensor is represented by a matrix or a hypermatrix or polynomial or whatever, okay? Some multi-index object. And then, you know, that represent that represent a tensor if that object satisfies a certain transmission rules. But, you know, the tensor itself was left unspecified, okay? Now, the thing is, what is that object? One possible answer is that that object, that tensor, is a multi-linear map, okay? A multilinear map is, and we'll see why is it that a multilinear map makes uh, is a perfectly good, uh, you know, object for uh, tensor, right? An object that was left unspecified in definition one, uh, because uh, it's gonna, we're gonna see that it's gonna satisfy the transmission rules. Okay, so that we have. Le a, Kang, yeah? let me just interrupt you. There is a question from sure. uh, Doctor Ichnang. I will yeah. unmute him. Uh, just a second, if I can find them in the list. Um, Usually goes to the top of the list. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask whether already for definition one, it's clear the notion of spectra for these tensors. The notion of what? Spectra, spectra, spectra. spectra. Oh, as in like eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Yes. Uh, well, sort of thing is uh, that's it's defined for certain tensors, it's not defined for others, right? The definition, so of course the thing is in order for it to make sense, you have to tell me what kind of tensors you want it to be defined for, right? Do you want it to be defined for general tensors, meaning the change of coordinates map that's gonna be invertible, or do you want it to be defined for Cartesian tensors, right? Where the change of coordinate maps is gonna be orthogonal, or some other, yet yeah, some other types of tensors, okay? And do you want it to be defined for covariant tensors or contravariant tensors or, you know, whatever makes tensors with makes covariant or contravariant degree? So of course, the answer ultimately depends on this, okay? Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the thing is uh, a multi-linear map, right? As I said earlier, you know what it is as long as you know what a linear map is, okay? So a multilinear map is a map on a product of spaces, right? And the thing is, uh, because it's on a product, right? It's gonna have a, a number of arguments. If I, if by fixing all arguments except one, 
the map is linear in that changing argument, then it's called a multilinear map. Okay, so the formal definition what is right is displayed right now on the screen, and you can read it. So the point is that this is essentially an extension of a linear map. Okay. Now the thing is, we're going to ask require that our the only way that this can make sense is the the co-domain. Okay, the 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 it takes value in a vector space, okay? It must take value in the, the vector space W, okay? And the thing is, uh, let's agree that when W is R, right? It's the field of scalars. Then I'm going to call it a multilinear functional, okay? On the other hand, if it's W is, a, you know, a vector space of dimension bigger than one, then I'm going to call it a multilinear operator, okay? Just like in a, uh, I guess this is a convention that's used by certain people. I use it just to distinguish operators from functional. Okay, functional means uh, W is equal to R, okay? Now I'm gonna write MD, V1 to VD, W, for the set of all multilinear maps. And obviously this is gonna be a vector space itself, okay? I can take linear combinations of multilinear maps, right, from the same, uh, as long as they have the same domain and co-domain, uh, and this would be another multilinear map. So the set of all multilinear maps is itself a vector space. Okay. Now, the thing is, of course, you know, in a case where D is equal to one, where I only have one vector space in the domain, then that is just the notion of linear maps. Okay. So it reduces, it includes linear map as a special case. Now, of course, the thing is, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, you don't really learn about this in linear algebra. We're going to see that, you know, everything that, you know, it's it's like uh, uh, just only a, a, a one or two steps away from what you already know as a linear algebra, okay? Now, the thing is, why is this important? Why, you know, uh, from the point of uh, uh, a physics, from the point of view of uh, physics, okay? The uh, reason it's important is that it sort of is the reason we can understand phenomena in around us, okay? Uh, so it, it's sort of based on this uh, underlying principle that I call the linearity principle. Uh, actually, I learned this from a book by Manin and Kostrykin. And so, well, they're using it to motivate linear algebra. So what they said is that, well, the universe is understandable because essentially it obeys this linearity principle, okay? And it essentially says that almost every natural process is linear, as long as I keep the change uh, small enough, okay? So like, uh, uh, if I look at, uh, you know, uh, Hooke's law, right? The uh, force that apply to a spring, right, is proportional to the distortion, right? And this is uh, obviously, you know, you have to make this small, right? I mean, if I stretch the spring, spring through break to to breaking point, it's no longer gonna be, it's no longer gonna obey Hooke's law. Okay, so the thing is, it has to be in small increment. Okay, so this is why linear algebra is useful. Now, what about multilinearity? Actually, it goes hand in hand with the principle of linearity. And the reason is because, you know, without multilinearity, you wouldn't even be able to observe linearity, okay? But, uh, and multilinearity principle says that if I keep all factors constant but one, then that varying factor, that changing factor obeys the principle of linearity. Right, so of course, you know about Hooke's law, you know about Ohm's law, right? Both are linear. Now, the thing is, uh, you know, of course, I do not know for sure. I'll bet that if I apply a current to my spring, okay, then it's no longer going to obey Hooke's law because, you know, I'll bet the current is going to heat up the spring. It's going to cause the spring constant to be non-constant, okay? So that it would not obey a Hooke's law anymore, okay? So the thing is, you have to keep other factors constant, right, in order to observe the linearity. And that is precisely encoded in the notion of a multilinear map, okay? By keeping all arguments constant, but one, the map is linear in that changing argument, okay? Now, so we can count, now come to tensors, okay? Now we can, uh, a tensors of order zero, right? That is not part of the, the, that's not part of the definition of a multilinear map, but I can take, that's always the field of scalars, okay? So that's given. Now, tensors of order one, what would that be? Now, this has to be defined, okay? So tensors of order one can either be a vector in the vector space, or it can be a linear functional, okay? Meaning a vector in the dual space of that, uh, of a okay, so if I just have one vector space, now the thing is, uh, why is this a tensor of order one, right? So the thing is, uh, we let's fall back on definition one, okay? If I take 
any basis of my vector space B, okay? So V1 to Vm, that's a basis. So that means that any vector can be represented as a linear combination of that, uh, this basis elements. And the thing is, that gives me a coordinate for this vector V. And that coordinate is a vector in Rm, okay? It has m different coefficients, right? And that is gonna give you coordinates for the vector V. And this is called a representation, right? It's uh, of a basis representation of V, right? Now, the thing is uh, you learned this in linear algebra, so there's no surprise. So it says that every vector in abstract vector in an abstract vector space can be written down as a concrete vector in Rn. Now, the same thing is also true for the dual space, okay? Because every time I have a basis, I also have a dual basis. The dual basis is simply the linear functional that takes value one on uh, one of the back basis vector and zero for other basis vector. And you extend this linearly to the whole uh, vector space V. Okay, so that's called dual basis. And I hope you already know this. If not, right, you know, can discuss it later. So what this says is also the same thing. We're applying the same principle, right? Every linear functional, right, in uh, V star, right, that's the dual space can be represented again concretely by a vector in Rm, okay? Now, so the thing is, how do I tell them apart? If I give you a vector in Rm, how do I know that it's a, it's a representation of a vector or is it a representation of a functional, okay? Now, this is why definition one begins to make sense, okay? You have to look at the transmission rule, okay? And the transmission rule is just an old name for change of basis theorem. Now, if I take another basis and I represent my V, uh, my vector V in terms of this new basis, let's uh, call it V1 prime to Vn prime, then the thing is, it's going to be related to the, the representation in the old basis, this one, by a multiplication of a matrix X inverse, where X is precisely the change of basis matrix, okay? That's the, when you express, express a VJ in a new basis as a linear combination of VI in O basis, the coefficients forms a matrix. If you look at, look at it over all I and J, and this matrix is invertible. If the change of basis, right? If the coordinates right, of your O basis is gonna to transform to the coordinates in a new basis in this manner, then I know that it's going to be a representation of a vector in V, okay? Otherwise, it's, it makes no sense, okay? That whether this whether this vector, this A1 to AM and RM is a, is a tensor or not, it makes no sense. It only makes sense when I start to attach a transmission law to it, meaning a change of basis theorem, okay? So definition one, if you recall, right, is precisely an awkward way to define tensors by is change of basis theorem, okay? And now we're looking at the most basic one, okay? If it satisfies us, if the transmission rule is A prime equals X inverse A, then it is in fact, uh, well, a contravariant one tensor, okay? Now the thing is vectors are essentially contravariant one tensors. What about uh, co-vectors? What, what about a linear functional? Well, if I change the basis, right, to Vj prime, and I look at the dual basis corresponding to this V1 prime to Vm prime, I would note that the transformation rule is now different, okay? The coordinate representation for the linear functional is now going to, uh, well, relate to the O1, right, by X transpose instead of X inverse, okay? So when it's X inverse, whenever it involves an inverse, you call it contravariant. When it involves transpose or nothing, it's just called covariant. So inverse is, you know, what makes it contravariant? If it's inverse, so in the transpose, you call it uh, contravariant, okay? So the point is that just based on the transformation rules, right, a vector transform like a contravariant one tensor, uh, or rather I should say a vector in a vector space obeys the contravariant one tensor transformation rule and a linear functional, right, a vector in the dual space obeys the covariant one tensor transformation rules, okay? So that's why, you know, vectors are contravariant one tensor and, and covectors, uh, linear functional um, covariant one tensor. Okay, now it's the same story if I look at linear operators. Okay, if I look at linear operators again, if I choose basis, I get a matrix M by N matrix that represent the linear operator. Right, again, the thing is this AIJ is simply determined in this way. Right? I hope 
everyone has taken linear algebra before, and this is nothing. Uh, this is uh, this is familiar uh, information to you. Now, when I change my basis this on my spaces U and B to A prime and B prime, from A and B to A prime and B prime, I get a new matrix that represents the same linear operator. And how are they related? How is A prime related to A? You notice that it's related in this manner, where X and Y are the change of basis matrix from A to A prime and B to B prime respectively. And where have we seen this? We have seen this in the last uh, tutorial, right? This is exactly the transformation law for A or the transformation rule for a mixed two tensor, okay? So that's how we get mixed two tensor. Remember that there is an alternative version where instead the transformation rule could have the same matrix X and X instead of X and Y. And why is that? That's because when we have the special case, when this linear operator is between a vector space V and itself, and we choose the same basis on, on, on that space, then this is the transmission law. Okay, so the thing is, now that I introduce multilinear maps, everything becomes clear. Right, every transformation law is attached to a multilinear map. Okay, and it is exactly the change of basis theorem for that multilinear map. Okay, so the transformation rule for max two tensor is the change of basis theorem for a linear operator. Now, if I look at bilinear functional instead, okay. A, map that takes Q cross V, two vector spaces to R, that is linear in the first argument, or if the second argument is fixed, and it's linear in the second argument if the first argument is fixed, right? Well, we see that this, for instance, right, uh, inner product is gonna have this property, right? Now, I can also represent this as a matrix, right? Uh, so it's gonna be an M by N matrix, and the representation in this case is very simple, it's simply beta evaluated on a pair of basis vector. Okay, I take a basis, a big factor from A, a basis vector BJ from B, and I evaluate that uh, beta on those two basis vector, I get AIJ. Now this AIJ, this matrix that collects all these values is gonna be a matrix representation for beta. Okay, it's essentially the same idea as, uh, as a linear operator, okay? Now again, if I change those bases, this beta, right, the matrix representation of this beta is gonna change, right? It's gonna change from A, to A prime, okay? And how are they related? They're gonna be related by A prime equals X transpose A Y, or in the event when I have U equals V and the bases are the same, then it's gonna be X transpose A X, okay? And these are exactly the transmission rule for covariant two tensors, okay? So linear operators are mixed two tensors, bilinear functions, Chanel's are covariant two tensors, okay? How do I know that? Because I look at the transmission rule, okay? Right, okay, so, and the thing is every transmission rule on this list that we saw last time, these are all the transmission, all the possible transmission rules for uh, one tensors and two tensors, okay? Each one of these corresponds to a multilinear map, okay? So of course, you remember there's a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The difference between the left and the right is simply uh, which, which uh, coordinate uh, which uh, which uh, a matrix or which vector I decide to put a prime on. Okay, so which one do I consider the new basis and which one do I consider the old basis? Okay, but essentially the left and the right are just identical transmission rules. Okay, just in the way I write, they differ only in the way I write them. Okay, now so each one of these transmission rules corresponds to a multilinear object. For instance, okay, I, I I talk about covariant two tensors. What about a contravariant two tensor? What multilinear object? operator or what multilinear map does it correspond to? Well, it's very simple. It's going to correspond to the bilinear functional that maps U star cross V star to R, okay? Where I have the dual space of U and the dual space of V to R. So if I look at a linear function, a bilinear functional from U star cross V star to R, it's going to transform as a co contravariant root tensor. It's going to transform this way, okay? In this manner, uh, sorry, this manner, okay? Okay, so it's uh, uh, every, every uh, transmission rule on this list corresponds to some multilinear maps. Okay, okay, so what about d equals three? Okay, now the thing is, uh, now that we have introduced uh, uh, multilinear maps, right, it's no more difficult to talk about multilinear maps right, of higher order than to talk about, um, you know, uh, multilinear maps where d is equal to two, okay, meaning linear operators or bilinear bilinear functional, 
Why reason is because this is now coordinate independent. I don't have to worry about writing down a three dimensional or seven dimensional matrix. Okay, so that's a good thing about not having to worry about indices. Okay, I don't have to write down indices anymore when I look at things, tensors in a coordinate freeway, okay? So it carries a lot of advantage. Now the thing is, uh, and we will actually discuss more of this advantage pertaining to computations and a variety of other uh, uh, common tasks, okay? Now bilinear operator is like a bilinear functional, except that the domain is now not real numbers. It can be any arbitrary vector space. So it's a bilinear operator. And the thing is that, you know, these rules are the same, right? It's linear in the first argument if the second argument is fixed. It's linear in the second argument if the first argument is fixed, okay? And the thing is, uh, you can also choose bases on U, V, and W and change those bases to some other bases and look at how the uh, representation of this bilinear operator is going to change. What is it going to change to? Well, okay, first of all, as soon as I choose basis on U, V, and W, this B is going to be uh, is going to be uh, represented by a three-dimensional matrix, okay? Uh, that's called hypermatrix, okay, to distinguish it from a usual matrix. Okay, this is now going to be represented by a three, uh, N by N by P hypermatrix. I should have uh, it somewhere. No, I guess I, I should have put that slide, but I didn't have a slide for that. But anyway, this is a minor point. Now, the thing is, what's important is what determines, what defines this bilinear operator is how this matrix A, M by N by P matrix A, transform when I change the basis on U, V, and W. It's going to be, it's going to transform this way. It's going to transform as X transpose, Y transpose, Z inverse. And remember that this dot means multilinear matrix multiplication. I'm multiplying on three sides by matrices. I gave you the formula last time. I didn't repeat it. Uh, well, so uh, what is the, uh, and the thing is, if you remember the general tensor transformation loop rule, if there's one, whenever there's an inverse, that is contravariant. When there is no inverse, Inverse that is covariant. Okay, so this is this B here uh, represents is no sorry this B here no longer represents this A here represents a tensor of covariant order two contravariant order one. So a bilinear operator is precisely a three tensor of covariant order two contravariant order one. Okay, now. What about a trilinear functional? Obviously, we can define that too. This is also an order three tensor. Uh, well, you know, it's defined a straightforward way, right? Arguments, right? Linear in each argument when the other arguments are fixed. Now, again, I can choose bases on U, V, and W and write down a matrix A, okay? A M by N by P matrix or hyper matrix, okay? Now, A, I, J, K is precisely tau evaluated on U, I, V, J, W, K. Now, how is this going to transform when I change the basis? When I change the basis, it's going to transform. Oh, sorry, this should be a transpose, okay? I should be X transpose, Y transpose, Z transpose. Sorry about that, okay? Now, so I'll fix that in the when I post this slide, okay? So that was a mistake. So the point is that you can extend this to any arbitrary order, okay? All the transformation rules that we talk about in definition one is going to correspond to one of this, uh, one of this, uh, multi-linear map, okay? Now, so, uh, and a multi-linear map, as you saw, is the, well, it's really easy to define. So this is, in my view, the easiest definition of a tensor, okay? Not only do you find an easy way to define it, you can recover all the transformation rules in the traditional definition uh, relatively easily, okay? So I like this, okay? Now, so, uh, what's the problem, okay? Of course, there's going to be a problem. Otherwise, there would be just, this would be the final definition. We know there is a third definition, so there must be a problem, okay? But nonetheless, you know, in the 1980s, you know, when uh, uh, people were talking about tensors, this is the definition that they use, okay? If you look at the books, right, you know, the, the slightly newer books, right? Remember that if you look at all those Dover books that were published in the 50s, they were all using the, the first definition, right? A multi-index object that satisfies certain transformation rules that are super confusing transformation rules. Okay, now the thing is, uh, now people realize that all these uh, transformation rules came from multi-linear maps. And in these books, 
tensors are all defined as multilinear maps. Okay, they, and note that they are physics books and they are math books. Okay, right? books like like uh, this is Helgeson, right? This is uh, Marsden and all this Goofy, all these mathematicians, and of course they are books by Robert Wall and uh, well, you know, Kip Thorne and uh, this uh, uh, a math, uh, physicist. Okay, so it's universally adopted in the 1970s and 80s, okay? Now, the thing is, what is the problem? The problem is that there are a lot more possibilities for multilinear maps than there are types of tensors, okay? According to definition one, there's only three types of two tensors, okay? You should only have covariant two tensors, contravariant two tensors, and mixed two tensors. But how many multi, a bilinear, uh, or, or so, sorry, how many, uh, 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 you know, uh, multilinear maps are there corresponding to two vector spaces, right? Meaning D equals two. Well, there are many more, okay? So here are some of the common ones. We look at linear operators from U to V, but you can also look at linear operators from the dual space of U to V. This is also uh, this is also going to be a multi uh, a multilinear map because it's a linear map, and therefore it's going to have a transmission rule, okay? And likewise for a linear map from U to V star, linear map from U star to V star, right? Can look at bilinear functionals, right? From U star cross V, U star cross V star, and so on and so forth. You can actually do uh, uh, there are other objects that I didn't define here because they're even more complicated and uh, messy. So the point is that all these different maps is going to correspond to just three classes of tensors, okay? Uh, if you look at the change of basis theorem for these objects, you can neatly categorize them into just three types of tensors, covariant, contravariant, and mixed, okay? Same thing for D equals three, okay? It, there's even more possibilities, okay? Because I can put star on any one of those vector spaces that didn't have a star before. So I can replace any vector space by a dual space, and that's going to give me a different tensor, okay? And same thing for trilinear functional, right? And you can build even more complicated maps, like uh, for instance, now, because you know I have three vector spaces, I can look at operator value maps, linear maps, okay? Like a map from a vector space to a linear operator, okay? It takes value that are linear operators, okay? Or you can look at maps that maps, linear maps that take operators into, well, vectors, okay? Well, or you can look at bilinear maps between objects like this, okay? So the thing is, uh, and there are more that I did not put down here, okay? For instance, I can put star, or I can put, I can replace any one of this vector space with their dual space, and I get yet other, you know, uh, all the three tensors. However, every one of these ultimately can be classified into, well, you know, essentially, covariant three tensor, contravariant three tensor, mixed three tensor of contravariant order two, covariant order one, and mixed three tensor of covariant order two and contravariant order one. There are exactly four classes, okay? Now, the thing is, however, if you look at multilinear maps, there is an exponential number of, uh, uh, well, there's an exponential increase when I go out in order, okay? So, Two essentially does this, right? Three, well, there's a lot more. And four, there's even more, right? You're gonna get like uh, maps from, uh, for instance, maps that take vector spaces into bilinear operators, maps that takes trilinear operators, uh, trilinear functionals into uh, into a vector space and so on and so forth. Uh, D equals one is going to be even more complicated. Okay, even though you know we know that there ought to be only as many tensors as there are types of transformation rules. Okay, now the thing about this is that definition three, the modern definition, the one that I will not have time to cover, it accomplishes this without any reference to the transformation rules. Okay, you don't have to talk about the transformation rules, and yet it manages to classify different types of multilinear maps, okay? So that is why definition three is, uh, is sort of the ultimate modern definition that people use, okay? Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, we won't have time to talk about that, but nonetheless, what multilinear map is also useful, uh, and today we'll just focus on that. Now, there is one imperfect fix, okay? The perfect fix would be to introduce definition, definition three, okay? That is the way to fix uh, this exponential number of uh, multilinear map problem, okay? There is an imperfect fix. That is, I just ins insist that my core domain, W, is always the real numbers, okay? Meaning that I only consider multilinear functionals, okay? And in fact, if you look at these books, that's how they get around the problem, okay? They, they, all these books 
would define a tensor as a multilinear functional, right? Because by uh, restricting what the codomain can be, you know, I sort of restrict myself only to one class of tensors. Well, that sort of alleviates the problem somewhat, okay? You, you reduce the number of possible multilinear maps. However, this is imperfect. Why? Because it excludes, right, the most convenient stuff. Like when I talk about vector, a vector in a vector space, that's by far the most common one tensor, okay? It's a contravariant one tensor, by far the most common one tensor. That is not included in this definition. So I cannot say that a vector is a one tensor. I have to say, I have to talk about functionals on dual space, okay? Instead of talking about vector in V, I have to talk about functionals on dual spaces in order to make you know, to conform to this definition because the codomain has to be R always, okay? And it excludes linear operators. This is by far the most common tensor, okay? Right, and whenever people talk about tensor in physics and in mathematics, but okay, let's say physics, okay? They usually mean all the two tensor that is a linear operator, okay? That is by far the most common type of two tensors. And this definition excludes that, okay? It also excludes bilinear operators, which is by far the most common three tensor. So this definition is, it's convenient in that it excludes a lot of other possibilities, but it's imperfect in that it excludes a lot of common tensors, okay? That's why defin definition three is ultimately going to be, well, you know, the, uh, well, the best one, okay? Right. Uh, nonetheless, well, you know, I shouldn't say best, but it's going to be one that addresses this problem in a, in a nicest way, okay? Uh, as I said, all three definition of tensors, are used to, okay, for, the, for different reasons, okay? For instance, this one captures the notion of multilinearity. And the first one captures the notion of equivariance, right? And the last one, right, the northern one captures the notion of separ separability, okay? And each of them is useful. That's why we are spending time to going over all of them. Okay, so, well, the thing is, uh, what about higher order? Well, if I, you know, what I'm saying here is that this definition is sort of bad because it excludes the most common one, two, and three tensor. Well, you know, what if I'm only interested in high order tensor? Is it still bad? It's still bad, okay? Because it's like, it excludes, you know, the most common type of tensors that you get from application as that, in, it, in a sense of, uh, and that those are actually derivatives, okay? So again, a very common way for you to get tensors is as derivatives of multivariate functions, okay? Now, before I can discuss that, you know, I this is analysis, okay? So this is analysis, meaning like uh, when I just talk about vector spaces, right, everything is algebraic, okay? If I want to talk about analysis, I have to talk about what is near what, okay? Which vector is close to which vector, which means that I have to introduce a distance, right? And the most convenient distance is a norm on a vector space, okay? Now, a norm can be, it's, if I look at the space of multilinear maps from V1 through Vd through to w, w, it's automatically equipped with a norm as long as V1 to Vd and W are all norm spaces, okay? If V1 to Vd are all norm spaces and W is also a norm space, then there is a very standard way for you to define a norm on the space of multilinear maps. And this is a norm that you are actually familiar with, right? You are familiar with the case when this is a, a linear operator, okay? What is the most reasonable notion of norm? It's gonna be how it maps the open ball, okay? How it maps uh, the unit ball, sorry, okay? How it maps the unit ball in, into the, the new vector space, right? And how far, how much does it stretch the ball, okay? And that's essentially the operator now, okay? Now, in this case, we have multilinear operator. We have looked at its action on a product of unit balls, okay? And so this essentially is the generalization of that, okay? So this defines a very natural norm on uh, the space of multilinear maps, okay? Now, so actually I have abuse notation a little bit, you know, that I am using, you know, this V1 to the V, V, D, they are different vector spaces and they ought to have different norms if I put norms on them, but I'm using the same notation. I hope you forgive me for that. And this is a very slight abuse of notation. Now, once I equip my spaces with norms, I can start to talk about analysis, okay? I can start to differentiate things and, you know, uh, talk about continuity and open sets and things like this. So if I have two norm spaces, okay, B and W, and I have an open set right, in 
uh, V and a map from this open set, right? This is no longer going to be a multi-linear map. It's no longer going to be a linear map. This is a non-linear map in general. The map from omega to W, non-linear in general, right? How can I talk about its derivative? Okay, this is, of course, it takes value in W, right? So as long as W has a norm, okay? Well, I'm assuming finite dimension, okay? Uh, everything is finite dimension, okay? Then I can define the derivative in the standard way, okay? I guess this is due to Frechet. It's often called Frechet derivative. So the derivative of F at a point V is going to be a linear operator, okay? It takes value in a linear operator, DFV is going to be a linear operator and it's going to be a linear operator in from V to W, okay? And it is a derivative provided it satisfies this, this, uh, this condition that if I make a small change in my F, then this essentially is the first order part, okay? It's linear, right? Exactly the principle of linearity. Any phenomenon where F is non-linear in general is... Uh, uh, well, it obeys the principle of linearity provided the change is small enough, h goes to zero, okay? The change is small enough and this is essentially a derivative. So this is the linear object and this is principle of linearity at play, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, the best thing about this definition is that you can apply it recursively, okay? Uh, this, assuming that the limit exists, then in which case it's differentiable, then this limit is... Uh, this object here is called the uh, uh, the derivative of f. Now, because this is operator value, and I know that L v w is also a norm space when v and w are norm spaces because it always has this norm, right? Then I can apply the same definition to d f. Okay, d f is now going to be is going to now going to take value in. Uh, the space of linear operators from V to W. So I can apply exactly the same definition, but with LVW in place of W, okay? And in which case I get D2V, uh, D2F, okay? So D2FV is going to be a linear map from V to LVW. And it's, well, you know, exactly the same definition, but instead of F, I now have DF, okay? So it's again going to be a linear operator, except that it takes value in the space of linear operators. So DFV is going to be a linear operator. D2FV is going to be a linear operator that takes value in a linear operator. Okay. Right. So the thing is, uh, you know, as you go up, you're going to get nested linear operator spaces. Okay. So this is nice, but you get maps that are hard to describe. Okay. Linear, nested you know, uh, linear maps, okay? Uh, I, I do not know if there's a proper term for it, okay? That's why I call it nested linear maps, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, can I avoid that, okay? Well, fortunately, you can, and that is by bringing in multilinear operators, okay? So, and the reason is very simple. If I look at a linear map from V to a space of multilinear maps, this is going to be a multilinear map with one more argument, okay? Because a phi of H this is a linear map, so it's going to be linear in H when all these are fixed. Now, it's going to be, it's, it's going to take value in the space of multilinear maps, which means if I fix H, this is going to be a multilinear map, and therefore, it's going to be linear in each of this argument, okay? So, it, what this says, right, is that these two spaces are equal. Of course, that is wrong, okay? Strictly speaking, I should say that they are isomorphic, okay? Nonetheless, if you look at the transformation rules, of the object on the left and an object on the right, you realize they have the same, they satisfy the same uh, tensor transformation rule. So as tensors, this equality is perfectly justified. These two spaces are equal as spaces of tensors. Okay, so this is this equality here is fine in our context because we're talking about tensors. Okay, now the thing is uh, with this observation, now the high derivative of a function is simply a multilinear operator, okay? It's going to be a multilinear operator from a product of D copies of V to W, okay? And with this, I can write down things like Taylor's theorem, like uh, with various remainders, right? Now, so the thing is, uh, this is one reason why you want to use multilinear maps and you do not want to just simply discard that notion, right? It's very, very useful, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, as I said, several times, okay, you know, uh, before, right? You know, ultimately, you know, each of these multilinear map has a matrix or hypermatrix that represents it, as long as I choose basis. 
So why not just treat them as hypermatrices? Why not just you know ignore, pick a fixed basis and then forget about that and just work with the hypermatrices? Well, the thing is, uh, there is of course some advantage with that, right? You know, people like hypermatrices. People don't like multilinear maps, even though you know to be frank, I don't understand the reason. Okay, the uh, multilinear map is a very simple object, right? Now, nonetheless, let's say you want to write it down as a hypermatrix, right? Okay, or a matrix. Uh, well, let's say hypermatrix. Okay, let's say D is at least three. Okay, if D is at least three, okay, then this problem, simply the act of writing down the hypermatrix, this problem is already intractable in general. Okay, that means, you know, if I want to do something like this, okay, if I want to choose a basis, okay, if I want to choose a basis, right, do what I did here, okay, choose a basis, uh, like, like here, right, and then write down this coefficients, okay, write down this AIJ, right, this is, of course, an order two example. Let's say if I have uj and wk here, and I want to write this as aijvi, okay? That is the hypermatrix that represents this b here, okay? Right, just the simple, well, you know, act of writing down this, this, this hypermatrix is already an intractable problem in general. We'll see that very soon, okay? And the thing is, it may not even be possible, okay? In Tractable means at least it can be done in principle, right? We just need to spend a hell of a lot of time to compute that, right? It may not even be possible, okay? That's the uh, thing is that, you know, so far, you know, the way I define uh, multilinear maps is over vector spaces, okay? I mean, uh, the scalars that I use are always going to be uh, real numbers or complex numbers. That's not always the case, okay? Multilinear map is a very nice uh, sort of a phenomenon. It extends to... Uh, modules. What are modules? Modules are essentially vector spaces where the few of scalars can be a ring. It can be a non-commutative ring. And we're going to see examples very soon. And it's useful examples that people use in LA pack, for instance. Okay. And the thing is, uh, if I extend multilinear maps to modules, then I may not be able to write down a multilinear map as a hypermatrix. The reason is very simple because whenever Le I need King, to write down as a Le hypermatrix. Le Kang, let me interrupt you. There is again a question. Okay. Is it easy yes, to please. convey the intuition where the origin of the Sharpie hardness comes from? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so the thing is, uh, this may not even be possible, right? Sharp P hard says at least it's possible, but you just need to spend a lot of time computing it, right? It may not be possible because modules may not have bases. Okay, the only a special type of modules called free modules have bases. So you don't have bases. If you cannot choose bases, you cannot write it down. You cannot write a multilinear map down as a hypermatrix. Okay, and the thing is, uh, uh, we, uh, well, you know, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this. In the last part, you know, you can talk about tensor product of spaces like L two R cross tensor L two R tensor L two R, right? And you can talk. So these indices may not makes sense, right? You're assuming that this indis, in, indices are, are finite and discrete, right? I, J, K runs from one to M. I, J, K might be variables, continuous variables, okay? They take value in R. And in which case, you know, hypermatrix is not even a, a meaningful thing, right? How do you write now a, a hypermatrix where the, 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 the indices are continuous? Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this. I'll talk about the other two, right? Starting from the first one, okay? The question that Idina just asked me. Okay, now the thing is uh, it requires a little bit of background, right? But all I'm trying to keep everything familiar in familiar uh, terms to uh, people in linear algebra and uh, uh, numerical linear algebra. And if, if you are in numerical linear algebra, then surely, right, you have heard of Vandermont matrix, okay? Vandermont matrix is this object here, right? It's uh, essentially defined by powers of a vector, okay? And you put the powers of vectors, you assemble them in a, as a, as a, in rows of a matrix, okay? Starting from zero power, the first power, and so on and so forth, all the way up to N minus one power. This is a matrix that comes out all the time. We saw it last week. We saw it when we have to change a Krylov subspace, uh, a Krylov basis to an eigenbasis, right? Uh, change from a Krylov basis to an eigenbasis, we have to use a Venomon matrix, okay? Now, so this is a sort of bread and butter for people in numerical linear algebra. Well, we can generalize this, right? There's no need to just look at 
powers that are consecutive and begins from zero through n minus one. I can look at any increasing sequence of integers, uh, non-negative integers, and look at powers that way, okay? Now, this is called a generalized Benamon matrix. It comes up in numerical analysis too, okay? That, that thing is, it may not be as well known as your usual Benamon matrix, which corresponds to the case where these numbers are zero through n minus one, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, what you can see quite easily is that when these numbers, this di, are each are at least greater or equals to i, meaning that these powers here are at least as big as the powers in the matrix in the bottom, okay? Then this, the determinant of this object, of this matrix on top, is going to be divisible by the determinant of the matrix in the bottom. Why? Well, because the thing is, uh, if you have studied Venomore matrix at all, surely you know the determinant. Okay, the determinant of the vent of a Venomore matrix, a regular one, is simply the product of xi minus xj, right? Uh, let's say i less than j. Okay. Now the thing is, uh, well, when okay, well, the thing is actually not, let me not go 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 uh spend time on this. I'm running out of time already. So well, the thing is take it on faith. This is an easy fact that the determinant of the matrix on top is divisible by the determinant of the matrix on the bottom, which means that. Whenever I look at, I choose my any positive numbers and make sure that these positive numbers are at least as big as you know the numbers in the bottom. Then this this thing here, right? This matrix here is going to be ah uh, sorry. This determinant on top oh, divided by this determinant in the bottom is going to be a polynomial. Okay, it will not be a rational function because it's perfectly divisible. Okay, so whatever I get is going to be a polynomial. Okay, and this is a symmetric polynomial. What is a symmetric polynomial? Simply means that it doesn't depend on the order of the arguments. And why is that? It, be, it follows from the definition, right? If I permute x1 to xn, I'm just going to change the sign of the determinant. But the, the determinant of the denominator is going to change in exactly the same way. So, well, it shouldn't depend on the order, right? So these are called symmetric polynomials. And let's take u, v, and w, right? Our vector spaces to be symmetric polynomials of degree d and d prime. And the last one is going to have degree d plus d prime. Okay, these are all homogeneous polynomials, meaning they have the same, every monomial is going to have the same degree. Now, and I'm going to define my bilinear operator to be product of two polynomials. So I'm going to take a polynomial, right, of well, uh, a symmetric polynomial in u, meaning it has degree d, a symmetric polynomial in v, meaning it has degree d prime, and form simply take its product. Okay, the product obviously is still going to be symmetric, right? It has the same property here, uh, but it's not going to have degree d plus d prime. So this map is well-defined. B maps u cross v to w, given by the product of the two symmetric polynomial. Okay, now the thing is, I'm going to tell you that writing down the coefficients of this bilinear operator, okay, meaning writing it down as a, three-dimensional hypermatrix of dimension d by d prime by d plus d prime is a sharp p complete problem, okay? Now, why? Well, the thing is, first of all, it depends on what basis, right? I'm going to choose a basis, and this is simply the basis where, you know, it's going to have this property, but in addition to this property, right, that the numbers are increasing, this numbers is going to be an integer partition of D, okay? Meaning that they're going to add up and it's going to be uh, equals to D, right? Uh, and I'm going to choose similar basis for V and W, okay? Uh, well, so uh, the basis for V is going to be an integer, this P1 to Pn is going to be an integer partition of D prime, and the basis C for W is going to be an integer partition of D plus D prime, okay? Now, the thing is, in principle, I can write B, the bilinear operator that, that takes two symmetric polynomials and forms their product. Uh, I can, in principle, I can write it down as a D by D prime by D plus D prime hypermatrix. Now, the thing is, uh, this is exactly the, how you write it down. I'm going to take a UI from this basis. I'm going to take a VJ from the same basis, but in B. And I'm going to write it as a, a linear combination, right? This is going to be an object in, in W. So you can write it as a linear combination of uh, basis element in C, right? So in, this is obvious, right? Obviously, you can do this. 
Now, obvious doesn't mean computable, okay? This is intractable. This AIJK are what's called Littlewood Richardson coefficients, okay? And computing Littlewood Richardson coefficients is a well known sharp P complete problem, okay? The person who proved it is Hari, uh, you know, it's a, uh, somebody who <laughs> is an alumni of uh, UChicago, right? So we're very proud of him, right? So it's, uh, this result is due to him. Now, the thing is, there's also a linear algebra connection, okay? Now, the thing is, this AIJK, right, this Littlewood Richardson coefficients are very important, right? These are not some stupid object that I made up just to tell you that hypermatrices can uh, are, are, are sharp P complete to write down. These are very relevant in a lot of applications, right, from topology to algebraic geometry to, you know, linear algebra, okay? For instance, Horn's conjecture, right, you know, that... You know, essentially, it's a series of inequalities relating eigenvalues of sums of uh, Hermitian matrices to, well, you know, generalized notions of trace, okay? Now, this was proved by uh, Kalyashko and Knudsen and Tau, okay? And both their proofs, right, you know, uses little with Richardson coefficients, but, you know, slightly different. Um, Lekang, there is again a question. Yes. So in the previous slide, I see what S of X is. What is T of X in this slide? T of X before? is another, uh, T of X is, uh, so of course, S of X is going to be an element of U, T of X is going to be an element of V, right? So U is symmetric polynomials of degree D, V is symmetric polynomials of degree D prime. If you don't like D and D prime, you can have to take, take both of them to be D. And I think it's due to sharp P hardness result is due the same, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you for the question, All right? So now the thing is, uh, I've talked about why multilinear maps are important, right? You know, is a general tool, right? You need them for higher derivatives and why you cannot in general substitute them with hypermatrices, okay? Because, you know, first of all, it may not even be possible to write them down as hypermatrices. And even when it's possible, it may not be computable, okay? Now, how are multilinear maps relevant in computations? And the reason, you know, I have to discuss this is because, of course, that, you know, this workshop, this long-term program ultimately is about computations, right? Uh, and we need that for, it's about tensors, but it's about computations, right? So that we can use them in uh, various applications in physical sciences and data sciences. Now, so we talk about higher derivatives, okay? Let's actually work out an example, okay? Let's actually prove something and, uh, uh, well, you know, and something that is uh, relevant to computations, okay? And, and by computations, in this case, I mean semi-definite programming or SDP, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, almost all of you know that SDP, right, can be solved in polynomial time using interior points, uh, algorithms, okay? And one reason why that is true, right, is that there is what's called a log ba a barrier function for the positive definite code. So as uh, Lekang, can... Lekang, there is a comment by Nick van Uh Yes. Uh, no, I think there was a, a question by Adina about TX in the previous slide, which I think was a polynomial of degree D prime. Yes. Okay, that, that was just a, a comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ah, did I not say? Yes, I did say that in the, uh, yeah. Okay, so the thing is, uh, so of course, right, you know, in optimization, right, you have to be able to compute uh, gradient and Hessian, right? Why? Because that those are the basis for Newton method, right? If I want to optimize an objective function, I need to be able to compute its gradient and its Hessian. Okay, in fact, the thing is uh, one of the condition for solving, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, SDP in polynomial time relies on the fact that the gradient and the Hessian can be computed in polynomial time too, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, uh, when you do uh, interior point methods, you have to add this function, this barrier function to your objective function. So that means there is no way you can avoid differentiating this function, right? This function is the famous log barrier function for the positive definite cone. It's simply log of determinant of x, okay? Now, the thing is I'm going to do SDP essentially is optimization over the cone of positive definite matrices, okay? It's optimization, but the variables are now positive definite matrices, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, uh, this function, you can write the gradient is very well known. The gradient of F, 
uh, negative log the terminal of x is actually minus x inverse, okay? And you can also write down the Hessian. What is the Hessian? By definition, the Hessian, right, in this context is defined as the derivative, right, as we defined earlier, of this multivariate function uh, gradient, okay? Now, so what is this, right? Remember, uh, a derivative is operator value, okay? So the value of this uh, Hessian is going to be a linear operator, right? The linear operator from Sn to Sn, that's the, the vector space that uh, Sn plus plus lives in, okay? It's going to be a linear operator that takes a symmetric matrix to X inverse H, X inverse. X is this positive definite matrix here, okay? Well, the thing is, either you know this, right? Or otherwise, you're not going to be able to sort of see this right away, okay? So this is very well known in semi-definite programming, SDP, right? And the thing is, uh, but, you know, to write this down, to see that even like the gradient is of log determinant of x is x inverse, right? And the Hessian is given by this funny thing here, x inverse h, x inverse. It's going to be the map that takes h to x inverse h, x inverse. You know, this would not be immediately clear to you, okay? Now, so the thing is, uh, because, why? Because if you look at like your standard formula for gradient or Hessian, they are useless in this context, okay? You know, formulas like this are only useful if you have like a R, R, N, right? Even so, uh, you have to have really simple functions for them to be useful. And of course, you know, uh, why is that? Well, that's exactly the same reason, okay? Writing down hypermatrix representations of multilinear maps, even when they are just linear maps, okay? It's not useful in general, okay? It's useful, well, when you have R, N, but, you know, formulas like this, useless, okay? You try to tr compute this using either one of these formulas, you probably will not get this, okay? It's, you have to do it with hindsight. You have to sort of know that this is the answer in order to, 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 to use standard formulas to get that, right? And of course, that's uh, besides the, that's entirely not the point, right? You, you want to be able to get this without actually writing down formulas like this, with, with, uh, right? Now, so, uh, so in SDP, right? you don't have Rn, right? In SDP, the vector space you deal with is n by n, symmetric matrices, okay? And so this tells you why is it it's a bad idea to identify n by n symmetric matrices with Rn times n plus one over two, right? This is a vector space of dimension n times n plus one over two, right? Every vector space of dimension d is gonna be isomorphic to Rd, right? So in particular, it's isomorphic to this, but you know, for, there are good reasons to not make that identification Otherwise, you will not be able to write down formulas for the gradient or the Hessian. And these are important, right? You know, because it's, when I need to compute this, I can actually use fast algorithms for matrix inversion and fast algorithms for matrix multiplication, okay? Whereas if you don't see this structure, right, that these are indeed, these are just matrices, you lose that capability, okay? Now, the point is, I'm trying to, uh, you know, get at is that I want not just the first and second order derivative that is well known. If you studied, studied uh, convex optimization, you know this. What about higher order derivatives of this function? And why are they useful? Because, well, you know, one reason is that we need uh, the notion of self-concordant, right? This log barrier function here, it has a property called self-concordance. Uh, and I will define that uh, for you later. Yes. Uh, there's a question. Yeah, okay. I just wanted yes. to ask in the expression there for the in the previous slide where you have the log determinant. Mm -hmm. So is there a transpose in the before the inverse in the gradient of f of x? Uh, no, because these are symmetric matrices, so there is no transpose. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, so these two formulas I set up. Standard, right? If you studied as if you have seen that. But what about the next derivative? What about the third derivative of this or the fourth derivative? How would I write that down? Okay. Now the thing is, uh, obviously, you know, the formulas like uh, you know, uh, writing down hypermatrix, like uh, you know, n by n by n hypermatrix, right? This is useless because it's not, you know, because I'm not identifying my uh, space of symmetric matrix with a uh, R n times n plus one over two. Well, you can get something, but it's gonna be a completely meaning, meaningless thing, okay? So it's not useful, right? Just writing things down as hypermatrix. We need to view them as multilinear maps. And that is essentially what this uh, part of the talk is about. You know, multilinear maps are very useful, okay? 
right? Uh, even if for things like SDP. Okay. Now the thing is, how do we do it, right? So uh, what I have to know is that I have to know how to differentiate a function that takes a symmetric positive definite matrix to its inverse, okay? So because why? This is the gradient, right? If I want to compute the Hessian, I need to differentiate the gradient. I need to differentiate this function, the matrix inverse function, okay? And if I, oh, there should be a minus here, sorry. Okay, Actually, there should be a minus sign in front of my X inverse. Now, if I try to do this, I know that it has to be a linear operator. And then I would be able to get the, uh, yeah, if I try to just differentiate this, I'm going to get this. In fact, this is how people would get this, uh, uh, this. Uh, formula okay i know it's going to be a linear operator if i differentiate this function once i'm going to get this now what if i differentiate it again right now i know that the next step if i want to get the third derivative of my little f log determinant i'm going to have to find the second derivative of my capital f okay so the second derivative of my capital f is a bilinear operator from sn cross sn to Sn. Sn is a space of n by n symmetric matrices. Now, it's not difficult, right, using the definition that we discussed earlier, right, to show that this is, in fact, given by this formula here, okay? This is a bilinear formula, uh, right? If you look at H1, right, H1 is a symmetric matrix, and H2, if I change H1 linearly, it's going to be linear. This formula is going to transform linearly. If I change H2 linearly, this is going to transform linearly again, okay? So this is a order three tensor, right? on Sn uh, cross Sn to Sn. So I can define tensors on the space of symmetric matrices, okay? This is obviously a mixed uh, tensor, okay? It's a bilinear operator. Now, the thing is, what about the D derivative? You can also write it down. It's just applying this definition inductively. And ultimately, you can get the D linear, the D derivative of log determinant as a D linear map, okay? It takes a D tuple of a symmetric matrix to this uh, alternating sum here, okay? X, it's each one of this copy of H, right? Is sandwiched by X inverse, right? It's sandwiched between two copies of X inverse, okay? And you just sum over them, right? And well, there's a minus sign here uh, because, you know, I, I should have a minus here, okay? Now, so this is, uh, okay, so frankly, I've never seen anyone writing down the D derivative even for for d equals two okay of this function uh but it's useful okay why is it useful because you need it to check self-concordance well typically people avoid this right avoid having to find this third derivative by trying to use some theorems that allows you to check like uh self-concordance by restricting it to lines okay that's like how Hank, like Hank yes. just a comment there are five minutes left Ah, okay, sure. So I'm about done, okay? Because, uh, yeah, so the thing is, uh, how do you check this? Right, you know, there is this notion of self-concordance uh, by Nestrov Nemirovsky, and it's essentially this condition if you state it for functions on Rn, okay? Now, the thing is, it's important because convex optimization problem can be solved to epsilon accuracy if you have self-concordant barrier functions, okay? And log determinant is self-concordant because of this, if I write down the formulas that I derived earlier, right, it's obviously self-concordant. Okay, so this is how you check that log determinant self-concordant without using like a, you know formulas like this. Okay, now the thing is, uh, let me just quickly mention one last application in the last few minutes that I have. Okay, well this is important because this is bilinear complexity, but it's also not so important because I believe that it, this is going to be discussed by a lot of people. Okay, so by far, you know, the most okay. important. There is a question by Joseph Landsberg. What is sigma? Oh, sigma is a constant. Okay, there must be such a constant. Well, in this case, sigma is one. Okay, and for my case, sigma is equals to one. Okay, so. J.M. Landsberg, for instance, is somebody who's definitely going to be talking about bilinear complexity. So I guess I can, aff be aff I can afford to sort of uh, uh, go over this uh, quickly, okay? Now, so if I want to construct the simplest bilinear operator given three vector spaces, I think about it a little bit, the way you're going to come out is this, okay? You're going to take a linear functional on U, a linear kind of functional on V, and you're going to take a vector and you're going to do this, okay? Now, this bilinear function of our operator here requires just one multiplication of variables. And the reason is because, you know, I only count multiplications that involves variables. 
uh, functions like a multiplication like 2u1 or 4u3, right? These are scalar multiplication. I don't care about those, okay? Now, what is bilinear complexity? Bilinear complexity is uh, the word in the title is how many such multiplications do I need to evaluate a bilinear function, okay? And if you think about it, this corresponds to uh, tensor rank, okay? So this is how tensor rank comes up. If you talk about uh, bilinear complexity, essentially it says that a bilinear operator can be broken up into linear functionals times linear functionals times vectors, okay? And only the product of the two linear functionals, right, evaluated at vectors matters, okay? Uh, the reason is because, you know, if I just count this kind of uh, multiplication, multiplication between variables, I can often also use that to bound like uh, addition and scalar multiplication. So this is a very nice uh, notion, okay? I'm gonna skip about the rank because obviously I don't have time. And the most basic example, right, is Gauss multiplication. If I take a product of two complex numbers, right, we know that is a usual uh, formula and that is also a very well-known formula that only takes three real multiplication, okay? And these are, so this is, the simplest example of bilinear uh, complexity. And it says that two complex numbers can be multiplied with three uh, real uh, multiplication. And this is optimal, okay? There's no uh, way you can do this better uh, than this. And the reason is because of tensor rank, okay? The tensor rank is exactly bilinear complexity. The, bi the tensor rank of complex uh, multiplication is three, right? Real tensor rank, okay? Now, why is this useful? This is useful because, uh, well, you know, nobody in their right mind is going to use this formula to multiply two complex numbers, okay? However, it's very useful because I can replace A, B, and C, and D by matrices. And this is actually used. This is actually used in LAPAC, which means that anyone who uses LAPAC as a library would use this uh, way to multiply two complex matrices, okay? And the reason is that instead of having to do three, a four, uh, matrix multiplication, right, n by n, n can be 10,000. I just need to do three, right? And I substitute them with matrix addition. My right? matrix addition is cheap. Matrix multiplication is expensive, even if you use like Strasser, okay? So, and this is a reason why we should allow for multilinear maps to be defined over modules, okay? Because when I look at this version of Gauss multiplication, I'm looking at the space of n by n complex matrix as a two-dimensional modules over R n by n. What are the scalars here? The scalars here are n by n real matrices, okay? And so this is why, you know, ultimately we would want our tensors to be defined over modules, okay? Well, I guess, you know, uh, yes, I've run out of time, right? So uh, let me just say one more thing, okay? Essentially, when you have two dimensions, okay, Gauss's algorithm is the only such clever algorithm, okay? Uh, well, you can think of other examples, right? Let's say, you know, I want to evaluate the standard inner product on R2 and the standard syntactic form on R2, okay? Now you can come up with an algorithm that takes only three multiplication, but it's gonna be essentially Gauss's algorithm. So this is the only algorithm for uh, three-dimensional spaces, okay? Uh, two-dimensional spaces, okay? Uh, two-dimensional uh, vector spaces, U, V, and W are two dimensions. What about three dimensions, okay? Well, the only interesting example that I know is if you consider skew symmetric matrix vector product. Take a three by three skew symmetric matrix, right? This is defined, this has three dimensions, A, B, and C are the only variables, times X, Y, Z, okay? Times a vector in R3. Then the thing is you're gonna get this, uh, three different linear functional, right? Now, the rank of this bilinear operator, right, takes its, uh, it takes a skew symmetric matrix and a vector and spits out a vector. Now, the rank of this is five or six, okay? And the thing is, I guess I'm gonna end here, right? I do not know whether it's five or six. I just know that it's either five or six. So I'll leave this as an open problem for the audience and I would end here, okay?